Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Buckeye Weekly Podcast. I am Tony Gerdeman here as always with Tom Orr. Tom, how's it going? Tony, is this the year the SEC gets two teams in the college football playoff? My column. And boy, it sure looks like it. When you go in and, and you beat a, a Clemson offense, a, a tremendous talented offense that, that we saw, and they just shut those guys down, and then you had Clemson scoring well over nine points or Georgia scoring well over nine <laughs> points against that Clemson team. I don't know at this point, even with a couple of losses, how you keep Georgia out of it. It was funny. I tweeted basically, just get ready to hear that for the next three months, just constantly. And someone tweeted back like five minutes later, like OMG, Joey Galloway basically said those exact words in that exact word. I was like, yeah, okay, well, mm-hmm. the, the good news is I still know what people are going to say before they say it. So that's good. Yeah, Thomas is not your first rodeo. You've been to many rodeos in the college football rodeo. <laughs> I've gotten bucked off of many, many a Bronco over the years by, uh, by college football. But we'll, yes. save, we'll save that for our bold pre- predictions reaction show or re- review show. That's, well, that'll be later in the week with me. <laughs> yes. We'll have a few shows about the bold predictions reactions because <laughs> got a lot I want to say, a lot of gloating mm-hmm. to do. We try to keep these shows, you know, like 30 minutes or so. And that's easily 120 minutes of gloating that I've got stored up. Uh, but so this show is we're just going to talk about the the weekend that was college football. Go back, look at, uh, react to some of these games, including uh, that tremendous. Everybody was excited for it, Georgia Clemson game, knowing all the while that it doesn't mean anything in terms of the playoffs. Like for whoever loses, it, it doesn't eliminate them. Buckeye fans should have <laughs> should have been rooting for Clemson in that one last night, and I put a poll out, and eighty percent of them were rooting for Clemson to lose. I think you get a Georgia loss last night, and then they lose to say Alabama in the SEC championship game. Now you then then they're probably out. Now if they run the table, and I don't know that there's anybody in the East that can touch them because Florida did not look all that great. They run the table, they lose to Alabama in the SEC championship game, and that's shoot, Tom, that's as good as a win. Can you can you want me to tell you verbatim what Herb Street will be saying after that game? Please do. I mean, look, you've got to look at the body of work. I mean, you have to look at the body of work that you that have this great win over Clemson, dominant win. You look at the look at the look at the hog mollies in the defensive line. I mean, they 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 are dominant against Clemson, and and then you, to run the, the gauntlet of the SEC. I mean, Missouri, South Carolina, Kentucky. Did I mention Missouri, Vanderbilt? I mean, you don't just walk into Vanderbilt and beat them by 20 points unless you're East Tennessee State University, sir. You sure how could you, How could you leave out? Yeah. It, how could you deprive the nation of a chance to watch Georgia and Alabama play again after they just played? <laughs> these are the these are the games that you just can't. And I mean, we'll we'll get to we'll get to some of the other playoff contenders who did not look super fantastic and it was like oh boy oh boy i can kind of see where this might be going but let's let's before we even dive into the show let's put the standard caveat out there let's put out the standard disclaimer do not overreact to week one do not say oklahoma is done they're done there's no chance if they've lost if they almost lost to tulane they're done like no you can't you can't do that Lots of teams have weird week one game results that you look back on three months later. You're like, how did that happen? That doesn't make any sense. So don't don't overreact. But like, yeah, I mean, if this was going to be how this uh, sort of shook out, that's a lot like what week one would have looked like. So I want to talk a little bit about this Georgia Clemson. Georgia wins 10-3 over Clemson. No offensive touchdowns in the game. In the Big Ten, that would have been a laughing stock, which it was when it was Penn State and Wisconsin earlier in the day. But of course, this is just two great defenses, uh, w- without a doubt. And you know they're great defenses because they have great offenses, and those great offenses were stifled by these great defenses. And I saw Ari Washerman, the athletic, tweet out that Georgia has 19 five star players on this team. It's the most in college football history. And I'm like, is it? I mean, how do, far any we them play, do, do any of them play on offense? Because well, it didn't look like it. Tom, in fact, uh, 10 of them play mm. on offense because I went and looked. And those 10 players produced. Tom, do you know how many touchdowns those 10 players produced? Uh, um, on, 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 on the offense? Uh, well, hang on. I'm just thinking back to my favorite offensive touchdown from the game. Um, I'm not sure I can decide. There's just, there's just altogether too many. Um, too many. Okay. 
Yeah. It's like yeah. choosing between your favorite kids. You can't. Mm-hmm. So yes, no, they produced zero touchdowns in that game offensively. And uh, so I guess that's because of the, I don't know how many five stars on Clemson's defense. I don't know if five stars cancel out each other. Shouldn't some four stars do something. They shouldn't some three stars do some, something and nobody on offense did anything. Clemson rushed for two yards in that game, which was pretty pitiful. <laughs> Georgia, 256 total yards. Clemson, 180 total yards. You can have, and I tweeted this out, yes, you can have two great defenses playing, but that doesn't mean the offenses aren't also bad because neither one of those offenses were good and the offensive lines were bad and there's a number of five-star guys on those offensive lines and at some point, those guys have to step up and and they didn't. And go ahead and credit the defenses and I'm sure the offenses will play better, but there should have been more plays than there were last night because, Tom, there were no plays last night. And it was just right at the beginning of the game. I mean, I think I might've tweeted this out on like the second drive. It was just like, oh, Clemson still doesn't have an offensive line. That seems bad. That seems extremely bad against, you know, and this is one of these things that they'll probably be fine for the bulk of the regular season. I mean, the ACC, we'll, we'll get into the ACC. The ACC had itself a weekend this weekend, but they will probably roll through most of the rest of their schedule because they kind of play a bunch of garbage for most of the year. But you're going to play a team that has a pretty good defensive line in the college football playoff, whether that's Ohio State or Alabama or Georgia again, maybe Oklahoma. You're going to play another good defensive line. And, uh, you know, there, there's a long way to go before the college football playoff. But boy, that that offensive line looked like it was just they were turnstiles last night. DJ Uyungalele got sacked seven times. That's all. And, and when he didn't get sacked, he just had guys in his face constantly. Mm-hmm. And so after the game, he kind of took the blame for the loss. It's like, well, you, you, there were some, there were some extenuating circumstances behind your poor play. So he didn't play great, but if you've got people in your face constantly and you have about a second and a half to throw, like, yeah, you're not, that doesn't necessarily let, let your receivers have time to get open. So that's a, uh, it, that that has to be a concern for them moving forward. And the good news is you got a long time before you're playing another team that's worth anything. So you have time to get it sorted out, but you got to get it sorted out because that's, that's two games in a row where they have just gotten absolutely drubbed up front. Yeah. And DJ, uh, um, Dabo, LA? no, 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 <laughs> I was, I was Dabo <laughs> rightly put the blame on that pick six on, on Justin Ross for like, running uh, the wrong way on an option route, basically, and saying, yeah, yeah, you know, he did the wrong thing. And it's always great when the coaches will tell you exactly why uh, a bad thing happened when they say, yeah, well, the kid did something that he shouldn't have. And now uh, that was a difference in the game. So good job on Dabo for pointing out that uh, uh, the college kids should be blamed for things when things go poorly and, and definitely don't blame the coaches for not having an offense that can actually out scheme a defense. Uh, <laughs> it was. I do. Um, I was a little surprised. I don't know that Georgia really tried to do anything to disguise or figure. Like I think Ohio State showed the blueprint on how to score against Clemson these last two years, and especially last year with all of all, everything they did. And it feels like Georgia's like, no, we'll just get an interception or something, and then that'll be enough. We don't really need a bunch of points. We can, you know, if if we just get six, that should be enough. And and they got ten, and it was more than enough. And so now they. We'll cruise through the SEC East. They do have to go to Auburn, which I don't, I mean, Auburn may as well be an SEC East team as well for as uh, up and down they are. Um, Tom, I guess since we're talking about the SEC right now, I want to talk about this LSU-UCLA game because that was, I don't want to say it was hilarious. It was pretty funny. (laughs) Um, There were some hilarious parts. I think, the reason is start, like some comedies just right out of the gate. They start being funny, like from the, fir- from the very first uh, scene. And the first scene of this game was in the pregame where Ed Orgeron, head coach of LSU, is walking into the stadium and some UCLA fan is talking at him. And uh, Orgeron says, hey, why don't you come down here and you're come down on the field in your sissy blue uh, shirt. And for one, don't make fun of UCLA's uniforms don't make fun of their colors those uniforms are fantastic they looked great last night 
And then LSU in their in their sissy blue u- uniforms just went out and pummeled LSU, and they controlled the game. They held LSU to 49 yards rushing on 25 attempts, while UCLA was rushing for 223 yards, averaging 5.2 yards per carry. They just completely manhandled an, L- an SEC West team, and it's um, further testament to the fact that Ed Orgeron is a fraud and this is his last year at LSU and it might, he might not last all year. He, yeah, it, that sounds crazy to say with him only being a year removed from a national championship, but also do you remember the less miles thing? Like, yeah, it, sometimes, sometimes they, they get their fire and fingers warmed up early uh, down, down on the Bayou. But yeah, the, the Orgeron thing walking in the stadium, which is kind of like, Oh boy, that's just that, the big dumb energy that he brings sometimes is like, oh boy, that's uh, that that that's on brand. I will mm-hmm. I will give him that. I, I was shocked by that result. I was shocked by that result. I thought LSU's defensive line would control the line of scrimmage. They've got a couple of good corners. Like how you know how how is UCLA going to move the ball against this defense? And then they had no problem moving the ball against that defense. I that was. That was the only game let yesterday that I thought this went 180 degrees from the way I thought it was going to go. I, I was I felt pretty good about where I had some, you know, I sort of had figured most of these games out semi correctly. That one was just like, nope, extremely. And I was that was about as sure as I was about anything it was like, this is definitely how it's going to happen. And nope. So, yeah, that uh, that was a surprise. It will be interesting to see what this does moving forward, because, you know, normally when you get into the narrative discussion of teams and conferences, you know, if a team, you know, if if Clemson wins the ACC, then the whole narrative is going to be, well, I mean, did you see what Georgia did to them? If LSU beats some good teams in the SEC, if LSU beats Texas A&M or LSU beats I mean, they're not beating Alabama this year, but if, if you know, if they beat, if, if LSU finishes second in the SEC West or third in the SEC West, no one's going to say, oh, well, they, they, did you see what UCLA did to them? Or none of, none of the people who are going to be puffing up Georgia are going to do that anyway. So yeah, that's, uh, that was, that was a surprise to me that, I mean, it was, it was a pretty good day for the Pac-12, not, not so much in the Northern division, but the Southern division had, had a pretty nice day and, and, uh, maybe the beneficiaries of some stuff that's happening in other parts of the country. So that was on the, on the whole, maybe not a, maybe not such a bad day for the PAC 12. Yeah. Uh, Dorian Thompson Robinson, UCLA quarterback through 260 yards, nine pass completions averaging, you know, right around 28 or so 27 yards per completion against those corners and those DBs, which was impressive. Max Johnson, LSU quarterback through a behind the back pass, which was pretty awesome. Uh, it wasn't complete, but it was, it wasn't near a defender ish. So, you know, um, good, good on him for doing that. And probably just the way they coach it, he finished 26 of 46 for 330 yards with three touchdowns and an interception. It wasn't terrible, but you know, it, it, it wasn't great by any means. And the, the, they didn't capitalize when they had chances and they didn't finish and you see the results. Tom, I guess we should talk a little bit about this Alabama murder. Um, 44, 13 over Miami. Bryce Young, 27 of 38, 344 yards, four touchdowns, looked exactly as advertised. Jamison Williams had a 94-yarder, the former Buckeye, four catches, 126 yards, and a touchdown. If there's any concern here, I guess it would be uh, Alabama averaging 3.9 yards per carry against Miami. That was a surprise to me. Uh, Nothing else was necessarily a surprise. This is just what Alabama does, and this is what happens to Miami when they meet up with real legitimate teams yes i mean it was it was a uh that this is one that went pretty much exactly like i would have thought like yeah this is this is a miami team that oh you know hey i think i think we're gonna be pretty good this year i think i think we're gonna be a ranked team i think i think we're gonna win nine ten games in the acc and it's like yeah i guess that's okay but um you don't seem to have the big people that you need to have to compete with alabama and that continues to be a problem and the speed is not quite what it is for Alabama, and the size is not quite what it is for Alabama. And you know, go, go back over the years, and there are not many things you can do that are dumber than playing Alabama in one of these early season 
uh, you know, week one neutral site games. Like it's just like every year Alabama just goes, goes into one of these games and it's like, oh, I wonder how this one's going to go. And everyone sort of talks themselves into, well, maybe. And then it's the exact same thing if we're all, you know, all over again. Because I mean, go back to one of our preseason shows. We were talking about like the teams with the most returning talent in the country. And it's like Miami had the most returning talent of anyone in the country. Alabama was at the very lowest. And it's like, everything should be, everything is telling you like, you should take the points here. And I very clearly remember not taking the points there because it's like, I'm not going to be the idiot who's going, why did I bet against Nick Saban in the season opening neutral site game? Like, I mean, you go, remember, go back to the, uh, the Max Brown year for, uh, for uh, UC USC when they, when Alabama played them in Jerry world and it was like 52 to three. And, you know, right before the game, I was like, I don't know, maybe this is the year USA. Nope. 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 Uh, I just pulled up the uh, advanced stats box score for it. And uh, 60 seconds into the game, uh, Alabama's win percentage was uh, win probability was over 90%. So <laughs> it was, it's like, yeah, that's about right. It was, you know, it was, uh, you know, basically 99.9% like a quarter in. And it's like, yeah, I mean, if anything, that feels low. So mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, again, you can, you can nitpick stuff here, but it's like, yeah, I mean, that Alabama team looks pretty good. And Unless they, you know, unless they lose two games, eh, I don't, I don't think they're getting left out this year. One last one, maybe uh, from the SEC, unless you've got some more. Florida, thirty-five, thirteen over Florida Atlantic. Emory Jones, seventeen of twenty-seven, passing for one hundred thirteen yards, one touchdown, two interceptions, uh, rush for seventy-four yards. This was a guy who formerly was once committed to Ohio State long ago. Was one of the oddly one of the the top Heisman contenders, and uh, this pretty much confirmed for me that Florida's passing game, is it going to be good enough to do what it needs to do? Even their second quarterback, their second quarterback ended up rushing for over a hundred yards as well, but not throwing the ball very well. So I, you know, Tom, we know Georgia's defense is great. I don't know if uh, Florida's going to be able to do anything against them. And uh, I, I think it's, we'll see how good Florida's defense is against some of these other SEC offenses, but I, you know, it, it, I, I just don't feel good about the situation there at quarterback. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Emory Jones is maybe benched at some point, just because I, I don't know that the potential is there. 27 attempts, only 113 yards. Tells me there's a lot of short passing going on and then plenty of incompletions. And, you know, eventually defenses catch on. It, it was, it's honestly a little bit weird watching some of that game and seeing so much of the read option as opposed to the passing game. Like, cause it's almost old school now, the read option. Yeah. And I mean, you look at the the stats from that game and Florida's success rate on passing plays was 35%, which uh, just to put that in context, Florida Atlantic six, uh, success rate on passing plays was 42%. So that's not great. You just, you can't be one dimensional. And again, you don't want to overreact to one game and teams make the biggest improvement from week one to week two and all the stuff you've heard a million times. Florida Atlantic is not a good team and Florida looked like not a good team throwing the ball against not a good team. So it has to at least be a concern. I mean, Emory Jones has always kind of been the running quarterback. Like when, you know, they would bring him in at times when Kyle Trask was there, when, you know, they wanted the change of pace and he was the running quarterback and he just, he looks like the running quarterback trying to run, you know, trying to throw the ball. And I don't know that the running quarterback is going to beat Georgia this year. I think that, that has to be a concern because that defensive line is pretty darn good for Georgia. I think you got to throw it over them. And I don't know if Florida has the offensive line to hold it up. And I don't know if they have the quarterback to, uh, to make those throws. A couple other quick notes from the sec with Mississippi state holding off Louisiana tech there at the end, 35, 34, Missouri. They, they, barely didn't, really, getting by they, didn't, hold, they didn't hold them off. They were down by 20 points in yeah, the fourth wow. quarter and came way back. And then, uh, LA, uh, Louisiana Tech had a field goal to the win it at goal. the end and missed. Yeah, they, they missed it. But yeah, that was, uh, yes, they held them off at the very end. Mm-hmm. But before that, they had to make a huge, they were, because they were getting clobbered for most of the game. Kent State did well for, you know, almost three quarters against Texas AM, did their best before Texas AM eventually just rolled over them as they should. Uh, poor Vanderbilt just getting destroyed by the best team in Tennessee, East Tennessee State. Oof. That was, you know, that, you don't expect much out of Vanderbilt. And this is Clark Lee's first year there. And it's like, okay, you know, you, you, you kind of get a mulligan, but like, 
you you use the mulligan there like that I, I don't think anyone's expecting Vanderbilt to beat you know Tennessee or Georgia or any of those teams this year but you should at least be competitive with the FCS team internally in, you know in your state like that's that's not good 23 to 3 at home against an FCS team that's not that's not good no let's let's move to the uh the Big 12 in Oklahoma 40 to 35 over Tulane and the game Oklahoma got a little bit lucky here because they were late in the game before before Tulane scored like their 35th point they uh, intercepted a pass and that got overturned and they would have had good good field position and it gave Oklahoma an extra possession and kept the ball out of Tulane for an extra possession and so uh, you know o- Oklahoma got a little bit lucky there Spencer Spencer Rattler with two interceptions. Uh, there's there's some good quarterbacks this weekend who had some pretty rough debuts, including him, including Sam Howell, who threw threw three interceptions and in the loss to, to Virginia Tech. So, if people want to get on Ohio State, CJ Stroud. If Buckeye fans want to get on CJ Stroud for not being at his best, he was better than these guys. Uh, I guess you know, giving up 35 points to Tulane uh, really quickly, they gave up some points, and it was like, oh. Oklahoma's defense is back. Alex Grinch has is uh, is is we have seen the actual Alex Grinch, and maybe Oklahoma's defense isn't as good as they were supposed to be. I will say, to their credit, they held Tulane to 100 yards rushing. Sure, they gave up a bunch of points, Tom, but uh, it, it didn't come via the ground. They 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 were uh, stout, I guess, against the run, 100 yards, and so what. Whatever, whatever else they give up, it doesn't matter. They, they held them on the ground. Yeah, I, I mean, you look at the success rates in this game, and it was 49 to 44 on passing. Oklahoma was slightly better in, again, in the pass, and 44 to 38. So they were slightly better on the rush. And it was just like, you, you, look, at the, you look at the advanced stats, and it's like, oh, this is like two teams that look fairly evenly mm-hmm. matched. And you think about what Oklahoma's the offense has been over the years. That's a concern. If your defense is making a Tulane's offense look like Oklahoma's offense, like that's a problem. And, you know, Tulane was plus two in turnover. So it's like, okay, I'm sure that helps. And they recovered a, an onside kick at the end of the game and fell one. I mean, if you didn't watch the end of this game, it was fourth and 13, fourth and 15, something like that. And their quarterback takes off running. It was like, oh, no, you're not going to get yeah. there. And then he almost got there. He was one yard short of making it. And if he had made it, then they have the ball at like, midfield or maybe slightly into Oklahoma's territory down five with like 50 seconds left. I mean, it was, it was like, it was getting real for Oklahoma and they just barely escaped. And this is a Tulane team that this was supposed to be their home game. It got moved because of hurricane Ida. So this is a team that's been dealing with evacuations and hurricanes and all that kind of stuff. And then had to go suddenly on the road. This was a surprise home game for Oklahoma, which is not really a problem. Surprise road game for Tulane is it is a problem. And with all that, they still there and the, you know the missed call. They still very nearly beat Oklahoma. That's, I mean, again, don't overreact to week one, but that's got to be a little bit of a concern for Oklahoma because this was the year that you know, every you, everything you heard from everyone, and I will include myself in that was. This is, you know, this is an Oklahoma team that may finally have the kind of defense that you need to compete for a national championship. I, I am not willing to write them off just yet, but I'm starting to, I'm starting to have some questions about whether this is, in fact, an Oklahoma team that has the kind of defense to compete for a national championship. Uh, and, and we can't write them off, especially while not making wide sweeping assumptions about the Big 12. Not a great week for the Big 12. And so, uh, you know, Oklahoma might end up being just fine. Uh, the um, you know Texas getting a good win against Louisiana. I think a lot of people have talked themselves into that being something more for Louisiana, but Texas was fine there. the The Iowa State Northern Iowa thing. Iowa State winning sixteen to ten over Northern Iowa. Northern Iowa. It's always interesting when either Iowa or Iowa State plays Northern Iowa and and to start the season, it's like I what it seems like Northern Iowa gets one of those guys. Uh, beats them one, once every five to eight years or something. If they get an opportunity, opportunity, and it's like you know what, I realize you want to keep the money in state, and you love every you know you love the state of Iowa. Maybe don't schedule those guys. Maybe schedule somebody else. But then they go and schedule South Dakota State and lose to to them. 
maybe what Iowa State and Iowa just need to stop doing is scheduling season openers entirely. Although Iowa did just fine, but it's just always funny how they have one or the other will will have some difficulties early in the season, but Iowa State finds a way to win that one. And that would not have been a good start for the Cyclones, but it also wouldn't have been out of character because they have these inexplicable losses, which is like, I, I, it's hard for me not to blame Matt Campbell for those things because you should be much more talented than Northern Iowa. And I don't care if you don't have all the talent in the world at Iowa State. You are ranked seventh in the country. You've got plenty of talent. You've beaten really good teams. This shouldn't be happening. Well, I mean, if you go by the talent index, they really are not a top 10 team. I don't, I haven't pulled it up yet, but I mean, you go through their roster. It's like, there's a lot of three stars on that, on that Iowa state roster and they get coached up and it's a fantastic system, but they don't have just the absolute, just raw talent to just, you know, the the way Ohio state can just throw the ball to Travion Henderson, just, you know, out of the backfield. And then he just goes 70 yards. Like they don't, they don't have that level of talent. They've got some guys on that team that are, that are, um, you know, that, that, that are good players, but they don't have just the absolute raw athleticism that Ohio state does on offense and defense. So you're going to, your margin for error is a little smaller there than it is. I, I have always thought that, that was one of the issues they have. You know, I, I think Matt Campbell is maybe one of the best coaches in the country because he's doing so much with so little because they, I mean, they really are not, you know, the, Talent wise, they are probably in the mid to bottom half of the Big 12, and then they're competing for Big 12 championships. That's really impressive. But you have a much smaller margin for error. And, you know, I think Iowa and Iowa State both suffer from the same issue, which is all the SC- FCS teams in, you know, you draw a radius of, uh, you know, a few hundred miles around their campuses. And like there are a bunch of real, real, real good FCS teams there. So if you're playing an FCS team, you're probably playing a semi local one. And UNI is real good. South Dakota State's real good. North Dakota State's real good. South Dakota's not too bad. North Dakota's getting better. I mean, there's there's a lot of pretty good FCS teams in that in that area. So you end up playing a bunch of these games that are like high high risk, low reward games. So yes, you should you should stop doing that because it's not working out real well. But I have a feeling there's probably some political uh, concerns there with keeping the money in state, as you mentioned, and all that. You know, but I, I think there's there's a decent argument to be made that Northern Iowa is probably better than some of the Mac teams that Ohio state ends up playing mm-hmm. that are in-state teams. You know, what would the line be for Northern Iowa Akron this year? I think Northern Iowa would be favored by 10 points, 14 points. I mean, a, a decent amount. I can, I can pull up Sagarin and give you an answer, but I bet you don't care. <laughs> no. And, and I agree. And that's why I say, just stop doing it. Play those Mac schools, keep that money in the Midwest we're all we're all just one big Midwest here. Uh, staying in the the Big Twelve a little bit halfway, Maryland with a thirty twenty four win over West Virginia, a really good win for Mike Loxley because it wouldn't have been a surprise if they had lost because that's you know until you stop doing that that's who you are, and so any win is a good win and yet. Talia Tungavailoa, 26 for 36 for 332 yards, three touchdowns, really using his receivers in uh, Dante Demas and Rakeem Jarrett. Both of those guys went over 100 yards, running the ball well also, and holding up defensively enough to get the win over West Virginia. Good to see there. Nice win for the Big Ten. And when I say it was a rough week for the the Big 12, like they mostly won, but things were a little bit closer than than I think, think they should have been, including that Iowa State game. Uh, Oklahoma State winning by like a touchdown over Missouri State. And, you know, just uh, it, it could have been more impressive. But again, the, the Big 12 world is is in an uproar right now. I wonder if any of that has to do with anything, if, uh, you know, things are just a little bit shaky right now in terms of, shoot, coaching, uh, preparation, all of that stuff. You have to think time has been lost a little bit by everything going on and coaches are trying to remain focused. But at the same time, they also have to think what's best for my family right now. Yeah. And the big 12 is always interesting to me because you've got Oklahoma who's like head and shoulders above everyone else right now, talent wise in the league. And then you have like Texas and Iowa state and they're pretty good. And then there's just a, a mush of like eight teams in the middle, everything basically below Oklahoma and above Kansas. is just kind of like, yeah, I mean, there's somewhere between pretty decent or good to like, yeah, 
I mean, they're a little short of not good. You know, they're a little short of good, but they're not terrible. You know, you can kind of go through that whole conference, basically the middle eight teams of that 10 team conference. And it's all kind of like, yeah, any of these teams could beat any of the other ones on any given any given Saturday. But I mean, the, the talent, you know, you look at the NFL draft results. There's just there's not nearly as much talent in that league as there is in a lot of others. You know, it's like the SEC and the Big Ten are kind of towards the top. I don't was last year or two years ago that the Big 12 didn't have a player drafted in the first round of the NFL draft. I think it, it might have been. Some, yeah, I think it was. I think it might have been last year. Like that's a problem. That is a big problem. And that's something that it becomes a self-perpetuating thing at some point too, where it's like, well, if you're not going to put me in the NFL draft, why am I going to, why would I go to your school? So then you get all these kids out of Texas, you know, like JK Dobbins. Yeah. JK Dobbins wanted to, you know, was from Texas. He got drafted, but he did it by going to Ohio state. Garrett Wilson, guess what? He's going to get drafted, but he did it by going to Ohio state. Jeff Okuda, Baron Browning, Quinn Ewers, Kayla Burton. Like it, this cycle is sort of continuing and it's because, you know, guys have left, had success elsewhere and then are going and going to the NFL. SEC teams are now pulling kids out of Texas with a lot more frequency. I mean, Alabama has pulled a lot of talent out of Texas over the years. So that hurts and it just sort of becomes a self-perpetuating cycle. So, yeah, I, I just the Big 12 is always a little bit of a mystery to me because it's like, you know, you, you normally look at those, you know, a league and it's like, OK. I can put, you know, I have four or five, like this is definitely a win or this is definitely a loss for these teams on the schedule before the season. And with the big 12, it's like, yeah, Oklahoma, Kansas, I got a good feeling on that one. I'm sure they're going to win that. And then you don't have to write, you know, you don't go through too many more games before you're like, yeah, I don't know. There are a lot of, there's a lot of coin flips on here. You know, like Kansas state can be Oklahoma one week and then lose at home to Texas tech by 52 points. Like there's just, there's no rhyme or reason to any of it. And it's just don't don't bet it, and also stay away from much of the ACC. In fact, you know what? Just stop gambling altogether. College football is crazy. Tom, let's move to the Pac-12, specifically Oregon, who uh, boy they were in a dogfight, twenty-four twenty-four late. They ended up winning thirty-one twenty-four at home uh, against Fresno State. Uh, All-American defensive end Kevon Thibodeau rolled his ankle, left in a walking boot. We'll see. How things go didn't seem like it was uh, x-rays or negative wasn't that bad uh but it was bad enough to keep them out of a tie game so uh that's that's not nothing fresno was held to 75 yards rushing 30 attempts that's pretty good by uh, the oregon defense oregon meanwhile averaged 3.8 yards per carry which is not great quarterback anthony brown was 15 of 24 for 172 yards and a touchdown hmm 358 yards of total offense for Oregon, not great. The crazy thing about this one is, like, one of the crazy things, the Oregon defense forced four fumbles, recovered three of them. If they don't do that, how bad does this game get? So they, I don't, I don't want to say they were lucky to, to win the game because they forced the fumbles, they recovered them, they played well enough to win, but uh, you know they play next week and something different, an outcome entirely different could happen. Yeah, and it was interesting to me because Anthony Brown, on, there was a touchdown run. That, I mean, mm-hmm. like if you watched only if you if you only saw the highlights on halftime of other games, you this might have been one the play you saw. It was a, like a thirty yard run where he looked expl- he looked fast. Yeah. He looked a lot faster than I remember him looking at Boston College. I mean, he was it was an explosive play, really good elusive run. Like Ohio State's got linebackers, you have to stay in their lanes and not not get over you know not over pursue. That's going to be real important against him. But you look at the you look at the numbers and it's just they're you know as bad as Fresno State's rushing was against Oregon. Oregon's passing was just as inefficient against uh, against Fresno State's uh, defense. I mean, the uh, EPA, which is expected points added, Tony. That's uh, what what you uh, Fresno State's uh, rushing was uh, minus eight point six three. Oregon's passing was minus eight point four eight. Like so, basically, just in terms of your efficiency and how often are you staying on schedule doing these things and your explosiveness and all that kind of stuff? Oregon's passing offense was just as bad as Fresno State's rushing offense, which we just talked about for the fact that, I mean, I think that maybe helps put things into context a little better because it's a little hard to do an apples to apples thing. But I mean, you just you just gave the rushing numbers, this sort of the top line rushing numbers, and those were not, you know, very obviously not good. And that's the context that uh, you get with uh, for, with Oregon's passing offense. Fresno State is 
you know, this is a team that we'll get to this with uh, UTSA in a minute with uh, Illinois, but this is this is a team that is better than you know the helmet or the logo or the brand would suggest that they are. I mean, it's a, it's a pretty good team, but they're not Ohio State. So struggling like that, and also potentially losing one of your real impact players, like that's that's a concern. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, the, the Thibodeau thing is obviously going to be like the story leading up to this game. Uh, that was, uh, you know, I mean, that's just a real bummer to see a guy get hurt, especially the week before a game that everyone's been looking forward to for a year. And it's like, oh, you know, what is this guy going to do against Nick Petit Frere or Dewan Jones? Well, now now we may not know. And maybe if, even if he does play, maybe he's not 100%. So that's kind of a bummer. But yeah, I, I this is, I think Ohio State fans probably came away from Thursday's game thinking, oh, Ohio State's going to have to play a lot better to beat Oregon next week. And then Oregon fans are probably looking at that that, uh, Fresno State game and going, oh boy, we're going to have to play a lot better if we're going to beat Ohio State next week. Well, and really that's that's kind of the way everybody should view heading something going in from week one to week two where you're not at your best at week one. And if you are, then you're going to lose some games along the way because you have to continue to get better each week. You got to continue to progress because uh, you know, you don't, you don't, you can't win a national championship week one. Fresno State, 30 of 43 passing for 298 yards. You apply that to what, what, what Ohio State will be able to do through the air. It looks like they'll be able to do some things based on that with the uh, CJ Stroud and the Ohio State skill position guys. We'll see if he just continues his second half from Minnesota where he's just, you know, some deep stuff, some dump offs, and guys just make plays. And it looks like this is an Oregon defense that can give up some plays. And uh, Ohio State certainly has the offense that can do that. The, um, you know, overall, like Stanford losing to Kansas State, I, I don't know that that's terribly unexpected. It would have been nice to see if it would see it closer than 24 7. Purdue struggled a little bit with Oregon State, but, you know, it's a power five win. So congrats to Jeff Brom and uh, they, they held on for that one. Washington though, Tom. And this is another one where, you know, these smaller schools that you, you, you got to respect them because they've, they're tough. And Montana has been that way for years and they go ahead and went 13, seven in Washington, taking away a, uh, an opportunity for Jim Harbaugh to get a ranked win next week. Yeah, that was that was a real shocker. That was there were three games that popped up that I was like, oh, I should I really wish I could watch that. Let's let's see what it's on. Darn it, it's on the stupid Pac-12 network again. There were three of those yesterday. That was one of them. And yeah, that's a bad loss because Montana is, you know, they're a good FCS team, but they're not, you know, they 15 years ago, they were like one of the, you know, they were maybe one of the dominant teams that you saw in the championship game every year. They're they're off that level now. They're not that they're not that great. This is not North Dakota state and to put up seven points against that team at home. Like that's a problem. And I mean, this is, this is for sure a game now that Michigan benefits a lot less from win. Cause if you beat them, it's just, Oh, you know, it's like Oregon beating Michigan in 2007, the week after Appalachian state, like, well, how much does it really mean? Cause obviously they just lost to an FCS team. Maybe they're completely terrible. And if you lose, then oh boy, you're you're the idiots who lost to the team that just lost to Montana at home. Like that's that that, that is uh, not exactly a win win for uh, for Michigan. Yeah, it, it, I, I was I was blown away with how just going through the numbers, like how bad Washington's offense was. Like I mean that that is they they got they got held off the field. I mean they, they just it was just I, I I I'm floored floored at how bad they were. I. I it's it's an it's that is one you just you can't lose if you're a ranked team you cannot lose that game at home and you know that that's now this is what jimmy lake's second year right so i mean yeah you 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 kind of write off last year a little bit they had a pretty decent year last year so this is like okay this is the start of the new thing and and what a chance to build the program and build the brand it's like oh boy and you know you you couple that with losing a bunch of top in-state talent to ohio state and other places like that's that's all stuff that makes boosters start, you know, looking at looking at buyouts earlier than they probably should. And it's probably not a very expensive buyout for a first time head coach. But mm-hmm. Washington, uh, 22 and a half point favorite in that one. They averaged two yards per carry against Montana. And that's just completely unacceptable. Bad, 
bad week overall for the Pac-12. USC did well, 30-7, to went over San Jose State, but you also had Nevada winning at Cal, BYU winning at Arizona, Utah State winning at Washington State. So, um, you know, not shining days there in the Pac-12. But the good news is that USC is probably, you know, a good top six team, and they're going to, they're going to fight for the playoffs all year long, and they're never going to have a slip up, Tom. Uh, yes, that that seems definitely like the lesson that you should take from every Pac-12 uh, season, every USC season. I mean, they played San Jose State, and that was a that was a game where I think you could that that was a game that in a lot of years in the past, you know, USC is at least sort of playing with its food for a while, and it that turns into a game for a lot longer than it should be. That that game was over relatively quickly. I mean, it was 13 zip at half. Then they scored, you know, they put it away in the uh, fourth quarter, winning 20, uh, 30 to seven. So, I mean, you, you, you know, it wasn't like a dominant performance, but that's a, that's a decent opponent. That is a, you know, that I, I would put San Jose state and Fresno state somewhat in the same mm-hmm. bucket talent wise. So, I mean, that's obviously a lot more impressive performance than, than Oregon had against them. So you know, it, it's. I don't think USC has the talent to compete with the top level teams in the nation, with the Clemsons and Georgias and Ohio States and Alabamas and Oklahomas, probably. But you're, you're, you're at least. You know, this is that's a team that could be top ten all year or most of the year. If UCLA is good, you know, you can you can sort of build a narrative around those two teams in the South. If Oregon can come into Columbus and win next week, then Oregon, you know, then then week one is immediately forgotten, and then Oregon is the team that suddenly in everyone's pro, you know college football playoff projections. That's that's the thing. I mean, I, I said at the beginning, like this was not a terrible week for the you know for the Pac-12 outside of you know basically Washington, because a bunch of the other teams that lost are like, well, what, what mm-hmm. did you expect Arizona to do? What did you expect Cal to do? Like this is what they do. Like it's just Stanford. Like this is just. The, the middle to the bottom of that that league is not great, but you're going to have USC is going to play Notre Dame this year. Oregon's going to play Ohio State this year. If Washington beats Michigan, that that kind of writes that ship a little bit. I mean, there's there's you can they have an opportunity to sort of shape the narrative around the league to a point where you can you can maybe get in over an ACC team this year because. You know, there's a real possibility with Clemson and UNC both losing week one and Miami getting throttled week one and Florida State plays Notre Dame tonight. They may be down like you could you could be to the point where if Clemson loses one more game at some point and UNC loses one more game at some point, like they're just sort of functionally out of the discussion. And then it's sort of Big 12 against Pac-12 for that, you know, the third or fourth spot, depending on how many SEC teams we're putting in this year. And uh, so, yeah, it is a. uh you know, I mean, this is this is not. It wasn't an ideal week for the Pac-12, but it could have been a lot worse. Yeah, it could have been because the top, you know, the top guys won and are still there. And UCLA did beat LSU. The fun part's going to be next week when Clay Helton and USC lose at home to Stanford. Oh. <laughs> Tom, you got anything else before we move to the Big Ten? Uh, no, I think I think that all cover covers the Pac-12. I didn't really have any. I didn't get to watch uh, Arizona State or Utah or any of those. So yeah, let's let's keep moving. Yeah, Penn State sixteen to ten over Wisconsin, uh, zero to zero for almost ever. Uh, Sean Clifford eighteen for thirty three for two hundred forty seven yards and a touchdown. He basically is what he is. The good news is he he didn't lose the game for him, and and neither did James Franklin. Which th- those are two pluses. Now eighteen carries fifty yards total for Penn State, so they weren't able to run the ball. I think that the biggest thing that, that I took out of this is Graham Mertz isn't good right now. And he, and he is, he is uh, regressing, I guess, 22 of 37 for 185 yards, two interceptions, fumbled twice, lost one, looked lost out times, couldn't handle the pressure. I, I we will see what tonight when uh, Notre Dame and Florida state play, whether, whether or not maybe Wisconsin should have kept Jack Cohn. Um, but I'm just surprised at how he is not moving forward. And in fact, how he looks like every other Wisconsin quarterback early on in their career when in fact he's a five-star guy and he's unlike any other Wisconsin quarterback ever, at least in potential and recruiting wants and desires. And yet you get him in this offense and granted, you know, they don't have a ton of playmakers. Jake Ferguson's a great tight end. 
Danny Davis has had a couple of nice catches, but I, I you know, I, I guess he needs playmakers. Maybe he, maybe he would have looked like Tanner Morgan two years ago if he had NFL receivers, and I'm sure he could use them and he would look better, but just looked uncomfortable almost all night long, all day long. And, you know, I think I was willing to write off some of Sean Clifford's like iffiness at times because Penn State's offensive line was just getting killed by Wisconsin. And Wisconsin's offensive line was holding up a lot better than than Penn State's did. That's always kind of the first thing I'm looking at is how does the offensive line doing? Because if the offensive line is getting killed, like, well, you're not going to score a whole lot. And that was not really the case with Penn, with Wisconsin. Their line was fine. It wasn't dominant like it has been in the past, but it's fine. I think Penn State's got a pretty good defense. But yeah, he just it just he didn't look comfortable. It didn't it just didn't look right. And you go back to like week one of last year where he looked just incredible. And then, you know, they had COVID and missed a bunch of games and just it didn't quite get back to that level again. And then now this year you you're starting out kind of with it with a rough home loss. And yeah, I, I think that has to be a little bit of a concern. And, you know, boy, all of a sudden Iowa looks like, oh boy, Iowa might be the favorite in the West now especially with a one game lead on Wisconsin already. Mm-hmm. That's, that's kind of worth, worth keeping an eye on the defense. The defense was pretty good. I mean, obviously they held them to 16 points, but it was like the touchdown, the first touchdown that, that Penn state had was just like a straight bust. It was just like, nobody went with, with the receiver. I think the safety just kind of bit down uh, in a way that Ohio state 2020 football fans will, will uh, remember from the early part of the season where safeties were just biting on like crossing routes and just like letting the one guy go deep. Like that was, that was a choice, not, not a good one, but it was a choice. There were, there were the two major busts. I think one of them set up a field goal. One of them set up a touchdown and you know, you take those, those two individual plays out and Wisconsin probably wins that game 10 to six or something like that. But yeah, that was, that's a problem. I mean, Wisconsin kind of got it going with the running game a little later on in the game, but it wasn't enough. And if you score 10 points in a home game, like that's, that's a problem. That's a concern. And, you know, they have, don't they have Notre Dame coming up relatively soon? I mean, this is going to be, I think they play Notre Dame in Chicago relatively soon. I think that's late, mid to late September or something yeah. like that. Week, so week four, week four. Yeah. I mean, you, you're going to have to get some stuff straightened out because otherwise you're going to have another loss before, you know, before the end of September. Cause that's, that's going to be, you know, that, that, this is, I, I came into this year thinking this might be the good Wisconsin year. And now, I mean, again, you don't want to overreact to week one, but now I'm thinking, ah, it's the good Iowa year instead. And it's just the okay Wisconsin year because the Wisconsin quarterback may not be exactly what we thought he was. Yeah, Clemson transfer Chesmalusi went for over 100 yards. Jalen Berger, nowhere to be found. I don't know. I didn't hear them say what was up with him. A concern there for me, Wisconsin only averaged three yards per carry. They, they ran the ball 58 times. So they somehow, managed to get uh just continue to not that they got a bunch of first downs but when you run the ball 58 times you've established something mm-hmm. it wasn't much but it was something 174 yards in there and uh just could have used the it was almost like whichever team got the explosive play was going to win and that ended up being Penn State because they have more explosive players although they didn't show it on the ground let's move to Iowa Indiana which was over i mean it was 14 nothing before I knew it. I think it was seven nothing before I even got to turn the game on. And uh, Michael Penix throws two pick sixes. Iowa, Iowa, Iowa wins by 28 points in a game where they posted 303 yards of total offense. Indiana had 233 yards of total offense. Like Iowa was, Iowa's offense wasn't good, but their defense was. And, and like, Tyler Goodson, the running back, rushed for 99 yards. One one of those one of his carries went for fifty six, or he's he was eighteen carries for forty three yards on everything else, which is like two point four yards per carry. Quarterback Spencer Petras was thirteen of twenty seven for one forty five. This is not a good offensive performance, but uh, when the defense outscores the opponents, it doesn't matter. And so Iowa was just fine. Uh, you know, Tom in my Big Ten ratings, I had Iowa winning the Big Ten West, so this bodes well. However. I also had Indiana tying Ohio State uh, in the Big Ten East, but mm. that's neither here nor there because we're mm. talking about Iowa. <laughs> yeah, who did Indiana play yesterday? I forget. Oh well, no time for that. Yeah, <laughs> it was it was crazy to me because Michael Penix, how he looked in the in the first half of that game, it was just like 
he looked completely rattled. Like he threw the one pick six and then, and then the second one, and it was just like, Whoa, what is going on here? This is, this is a veteran quarterback who is good. Like when he's healthy, he's one of the better quarterbacks in the big 10. He's healthy as far as I know. And he just looked completely rattled. It was, that might've been just one of those Kinnick games where, you know, go back to 2017, JT Barrett throws a pick six on the first play of the game. And it just completely unravels in Ohio state. And, you know, you, at the end of the game, you look and you're like, how did they give up 55 points to this Iowa team? Like what, how is that even possible? And that was that, I think that was Indiana walking out of that stadium. Like, how did we lose by four touchdowns to this team when they weren't, you know, this was not a dominant, like air raid offensive performance. It was just, it just unraveled on Indiana yesterday. And with a veteran quarterback, that's that's always really surprising to see. That just it, it doesn't it, that that's not what you expect. You know, this is an Indiana team that this is not the Bill Lynch Indiana where it's just like you're waiting for the roof to fall in. This is a good Indiana team, and it just it just was that was just not happening for them yesterday. Uh, boy, Iowa, they go to Ames this weekend. That's going to be an interesting one. I, I that that seems like one that a lot of people are going to overreact to week one and go real heavy in on Iowa. And it's like, I don't know. I, I don't know if I would. I think I think there's going to be an overreaction to that. You know, people are going to say Iowa by three touchdowns. Like, no, 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 that's not. First of all, that's not how that game ever works. And second of all, I, I still think Iowa State might be more talented, but Matt Campbell's never beaten Iowa. So that's uh, he, he, he better beat Iowa this year. That, that That is a big, big game. But then they've got Kent State at home, which is a game that they. You can, you, I could see, I, I could see Iowa losing that game. Like it, beat you, Iowa that, state, come beat back Iowa lose state, Kent lose to Kent state. Like that's, that is well within range. Then they get Colorado state who lost to someone terrible last night. I forget who, uh, and then at Maryland, which is a little dicey home for Penn state. Like that's, that's suddenly a big game in the big 10 Penn state at Iowa, uh, October 9th. They do have to go to Wisconsin. That's kind of the one. You know, go, Kent State at home is just the big flashing red trap game to me. And then at at Wisconsin, that's a little dicey. So, but other than that, I mean, they could, this team could very easily be 10 and two this year, like very easily if they get, you know, especially if they win next week. This is, this is an Iowa team that you might just see in Indianapolis in, the, in a few months. As predicted by me, uh, but that, that game at Wisconsin is, could be the the de facto division championship game. Not that they have those, of course. We're gonna talk more about Michigan in our Michigan Monday podcast, but I we could touch on them here in a little, for a little bit. I was really impressed by what they did. They ran the ball, did whatever they wanted. Didn't have to throw the ball much, but when they did, they had some big plays. They had some big plays from the receivers in the running game as well. Some jet sweeps there. Defensively, they uh, they still have their secondary issues, their cornerback issues. And this was a brand new system, so we'll see how things go. I thought there were some interesting things on defense, but overall, more than uh, they should be more than happy with how things turned out. Forty to forty-seven to fourteen over one of the MAC favorites. I mean, anytime a Big Ten team does that, you're doing well. Yeah, and it, it. I don't know that they've solved all their problems, but it was like there's been some progress here. That's that was a better performance than I was expecting out of them week one. I, I thought that might end up twenty-eight to fourteen or something like that, where it's you know. No one's, you know, no one's really happy. Western Michigan is not really happy at the end of the game. Michigan's not really happy at the end of the game. Fans are walking out going, we only beat that team by two touchdowns. Like, and that wasn't what it was. They, they ran the ball better than expected. Blake Corum looks like what mm-hmm. we were told Blake Corum was going to look like and what Blake Corum did not look at all like last year. So that, that'll be, uh, it'll be interesting to, to see. And then, you know, let's, let's see what the defensive line looks like uh, against a better uh, opponent. Let's let's see what the how that defensive line holds up against a better opponent. I'm still not 100 percent sold. Now I don't know that we're going to get the answer to that when uh, they play uh, Washington next week. All of a sudden, that that is not necessarily the uh, bellwether game that we thought it might be. But yeah, we'll we'll talk more about this on the episode of Michigan Monday that'll drop tomorrow. A Friday game, Michigan State Northwestern. Uh, Kenneth Walker. Wow, uh, uh-huh. he was dynamic. He I got to watch rewatch some of that and. This wasn't just huge holes or whatever. He was making moves. He was like planting guys. This was a very talented dude that could be doing more transfer from Wake Forest, I believe. And we'll see what else he can do this season. But if you've got somebody that you can rely on like that, 
and you've got Peyton Thorne, I believe their quarterback played well enough and was they're just as long as you don't lose games against a team like Northwestern, which has lost everybody essentially, and they were not good. And you know, Hunter Johnson has already been a failed experiment at quarterback for Northwestern before, but they're going to try it again, see if the alchemy works this time. But against Northwestern, if you just don't screw it up, you're going to be okay, even on the road. But they did more than that, screwed up. Like Walker was uh, outstanding, and I was listening to that game, and I could not have been more impressed from what I heard. And then I was even more impressed by what I saw from it. Yeah, it, it looked impressive on TV, and and. You know, that that's a team where he's at Walker averaged 11.5 yards per carry, 23 carries, 264 yards, four touchdowns. He was someone who was, I mean, just like a nothing out of high school. He was the uh, 2,164th ranked player out of high school, the 143rd uh, running back, the uh, 57th ranked player out of Tennessee, his uh, senior year of high school in 2019. Like that's that's uh, remarkably bad. That I mean, it's just that that's that's the kind of guy that you you expect to see, like oh, you know, I mean, like FCS level player, something like that, and just he he didn't look like any of those things on, on Friday night. That 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 was a really impressive uh, performance. And you know, if you can get a couple big plays and get out in front of Northwestern, Northwestern at that point is just like a turtle on their back. Like, well. This is bad, and I can't do anything about it. So, sorry. Well, I guess we'll see you next week. Can someone flip me over, please? And no one flipped them over. That 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 they were in trouble, and they stayed in trouble that whole game. Yeah, I that Northwestern team is not not going to be good this year. And I, I think you know, I think that that Michigan State team is going to be a little ahead of where I think both of us thought they would be. We'll talk more about this in Michigan Monday, but. With, with the Wolverines, like uh, Michigan State didn't look bad. Maryland didn't look bad. Penn State's obviously tough. Uh, Michigan's going to have some work to do. And, of course, Ohio State will as well. Tom, let's close by staying in the state. Illinois losing 37-30 to 30 to uh, Texas San Antonio. The Illini allowed 496 total yards. And Illinois was even plus one in turnovers. And they still lose. Art Sikowski, three, three touchdowns, no interceptions. Anytime he throws zero interceptions, I think that's a – a win, but he only completed basically 50% of his passes. They couldn't run the ball. It's, um, you know, just a, a disappointing loss at home. Favorite, only favored by like, I think four and a half, I think. And so it, clearly it wasn't, it wasn't a Washington, Montana type of thing. But after a win in the Big Ten against Nebraska, you would like to respond by, oh, I don't know. Beating a are they Sun Belt? Are they uh, you know. UTSA? They may be CUSA. I believe they're CUSA. CUSA. Yeah, CUSA. Yeah. So like you should win this game, and they didn't, and so we'll see how they respond. <laughs> but now we know, Tom, that they will not be playing in a Big Ten championship game because I just don't think they're good enough. <laughs> well, it's not. You got to remember that's not a conference loss. So I know you can't, you can't rule them out yet. Yeah, I. <sighs> I don't know if uh, I don't know who felt worse about that game yesterday, whether it was Nebraska fans or Illinois fans. Oh. Uh, just mm. I don't I don't think the uh, week zero loss to uh, Illinois is going to age particularly well for Scott Frost. They they got a win over Fordham. That good good that's good. But yeah, that that's I, Illinois is what they are right now, and that is a team that doesn't have a whole heck of a lot of talent and is going to kind of just have to do it with duct tape and bailing wire whenever they do it. And I don't know how frequently they're really going to do it, but you know, that is not a, that's not as bad a loss as it would seem just looking at the helmets like that. UTSA is actually a pretty decent team. You should beat them at home if you're any kind of a halfway decent big 10 team, but I don't know that Illinois is a halfway decent big 10 team. So maybe it kind of all makes sense. It certainly makes sense watching the inexplicable or the, the bad losses or just the, the losses where you look at the schedule before the season, okay, that you count that as a win. I'm sure we all counted that as a win, and then it doesn't happen. And it's like, yeah, okay, that makes sense. We should never count the count all the wins that we think are going to be wins. Don't ever count all of them as wins. Count one of them as a loss because there's going to be a loss in there. So I think that will do it, Tom. You got anything else before we uh, call it a day? I, I don't. Did you actually mention Rutgers when we were talking about the East? You kind not, of ran, you kind of yeah, ran through like, a bunch of the other teams. Rutgers, that was another six, interesting one. Yeah. That, Rutgers, they, uh, yeah, Rutgers 61, Temple 14. And 
you know, I mean, I, that was one we had as a win on Rutgers schedule when we were talking about them having potentially six wins this year. That's exactly, you know, Temple is not a good team. That is exactly what you should do to a team that's not a good team. And Temple's not, this is not, Temple's not like a bad FCS team. I mean, think, how, when was the last time Rutgers beat a team by, uh, what, 47 <laughs> points? I mean, it's probably been a minute. Big East days? Yeah, I, I mean, like that, for Rutgers to have the talent to beat a team by 47 points, even if it's not, you know, a not particularly good AAC team, that's that's significant to me. That tells me something. That tells me that Rutgers is kind of getting, you know, they're getting it together in the way that I think we thought they would gonna kind of be getting it together. The Big Ten East might be pretty good this year, and that that could be very bad news for a team like Indiana, which, you know, the margin for because Ohio State, I think you know what you've got. Penn State just had a big win. Michigan State just had a big win. Michigan just had a big win. Maryland just had a big win. And Rutgers just had a big win. So that's everyone in the division except for Indiana, who just had a big blowout loss. And I will say for about the seventh time in this show, you don't want to overreact to week one. But if Indiana was going to go seven and five this year or six and six this year and have a massive regression to the mean, a schedule loaded with teams that are suddenly looking a lot better overall. Like now, I think there are some that you may have had penciled in as W's on that, that Indiana schedule earlier that are now like, mm, maybe that's more of a coin flip or at least a little more competitive than, than you would have thought initially. So yeah, that one, that one was really interesting to me. That was just, it, you know, I, I will not, I will not tell you that I watched a second of that game. It was just one of those that came across the ticker. It was like, Oh, Oh, okay. That's that, that tells me something without having seen anything. Now, Tom, what if I tell you Rutgers averaged four and a half yards per play and they were plus five in the turnovers? Well, is that all true? Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, mm, mm. that's, I mean, that's less, that's less good. I mean, that's, that's, it's not less good. It's just less sustainable, but yeah, oh yeah. again, but that's still, what you, that's what start. you need to, that's what you need to do. I mean, this is it, for them to do for them to, uh, you know, do that to anyone is significant to me. Uh, and I, I, I know you're going to try and wrap up. I'm going to tell you Presbyterian quarterback, Ren Hef- Hefley. 10 touchdowns, 76% completions, 538 yards, 10 touchdowns, zero INTs. Why am I talking about uh, the Presbyterian Blue Hose? First of all, because ESPN's headline called them the Presbyterian Blue Horse, which now I'm going to use that all the time, <laughs> which is great. Like, ah, ah, look who, look who doesn't know their stuff. Worldwide leader in not knowing stuff. Um, that's the high school, uh, the high school. That's the college where former high school coach uh, Kevin Kelly is coaching this year. Kevin Kelly is the guy who coached Pulaski Academy in Arkansas for a million years, took them from a not very good team to a constant Arkansas State high school champion because he's the guy who never punts. Um, and you know he punts every once in a while, but he'll punt a couple times a season, basically. And he doesn't punt. He doesn't onside kick. And, you know, they played St. Andrews. And um, as far as I know, that's a golf course, but still that's uh I, I, don't, I don't, I couldn't even tell you what level St. Andrews is. They, I don't think they're an FCS team, but maybe they are. But the, uh, the Kevin Kelly never punt college experiment is off to a really interesting, exciting start. I, I am, I have been following the Presbyterian Twitter account and uh, following Kevin Kelly for years. And I am super, super intrigued what that looks like. Cause that is, you know, that is something that has the possibility if it works of kind of changing the game of college football for forever. Yeah, it's it, it will be interesting to see how long it takes to catch on because football is a copycat sport. And so that uh, so it just takes somebody else to do it and then somebody else to do it. Uh, do you know where uh, Ren Hefley played last year, Tom? Uh, he was a walk-on at the University of Michigan. He's, he's a, an Arkansas kid who went to Michigan, walked on as a walk-on for uh, 2019 to 2020, yes. And then... Uh, transferred to Presbyterian. And it was like, man, oh man, that is, I, I am, I mean, 84 points in your first game. And I don't like, I don't care who you're playing. Like mm-hmm. 84 mm-hmm. points is like, all right, that's, you're doing something. I, I am fully expecting this to take a little bit while, a little while for this to really, uh, you know, catch on and, and kick into gear. Cause I, you know, I don't, I, I can't tell you that I have a great feel for the personnel available at Presbyterian right now, but I suspect it is not super fantastic. But I am real intrigued to see where where that program is like two, three years from now. You just all they have to do this year is not have a disaster of a season 
where someone panics and pulls the ripcord immediately. Like, this is too crazy. We can't do it. We can't do it. Like, you just need to have a little patience and like, let's, let's see where this little scientific experiment goes. It'll be interesting to see what he looks like next year, coaching at Washington state after Nick Relevich gets fired. <laughs> Even the backup quarterback in that game for Presbyterian was like, it was seven for nine, for two touchdowns. And uh, they were just uh, having some fun out there. So yeah, definitely one to watch something to keep an eye out. One of those teams like, let's just check in each week to see how things are going. They did not punt this week. Uh, they still gave up uh, nearly 50 points though, Tom. So might want to get a new defensive coordinator over there at Presbyterian. <laughs> but we'll covered, see. covered uh, I don't know if I don't know if it's a 40 point spread, but if it was, they covered it. So it turned it turned out okay. Yes. If only Luke Fickle after, instead of when he was at Ohio State saying, Did we win? If, if he would just answer, Did we cover? Did we cover <laughs> the coach? You're not supposed to say that stuff, but that will do it for this weekend's uh, wrap up show. Thank you guys for listening. Thanks for watching. As always, check out BuckeyeScoop.com. If you are not yet a member, please become one. You can also find us at YouTube.com slash BuckeyeScoop for all of our podcasts, all of our interviews, all of the post games that we have, pre games that we have, everything we do there. Anytime it's on video, it shows up on YouTube. So check that out. Thank you guys for watching and listening, and we will talk to you all later.